So, yeah. thanks, Stephen. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, signaling and communication, and I'm going to be uh, talking about that within the context of sex allocation decisions and sex allocation theory. Um, so specifically, I'm going to be looking at uh, hermaphrodism. And hermaphrodism is pretty important to study because there's a whole bunch of organisms that are hermaphroditic. Uh, so understanding how they can reach their sex allocation decisions is important for understanding the ecology and evolution of, of, of the ecological, ecological systems. Um, but hermaphrodites can also give us insight into uh, the evolution of sex in general. So uh, they're an important theoretical model, I guess, theoretical empirical model. So the key questions is how and why uh, individuals allocate energy in sexual reproduction, and the objective is to understand the ecology and evolution of biological systems. So I've been pondering this, this image for a pretty long time, uh, and, the, and the issue is that uh, when individuals form groups for the purpose of reproduction and their sex allocation strategy is flexible, uh, they, they're facing a consensus decision problem in that if they don't get their sex allocation strategy right, some of those individuals are going to lose out on reproduction, but importantly, even the most dominant individual in that group is also going to lose out on reproduction. Uh, so even in the face of conflict over sex roles, um, there's an incentive for individuals to coordinate their sex allocation strategy. So, and this is the case particularly when we have group sizes of more than two or specifically when we don't have random pairing of individuals uh, in, in a one-shot uh, reproductive game, but rather we have uh, individuals that are forming uh, long-lasting groups. But the, uh, the issue of uh, coordinating sex strategy is important both in this situation where we have minimal conflict over reproductive shares um, and, and also in this, con in this situation where we have uh, potentially a lot of conflict over reproductive shares. So the question then is, well, is there a way in which individuals can uh, come to a uh, corporate solution, to come to a consensus decision, uh, given the fact that you know, individuals, of course, want to play the role, whatever it might be, that's going to maximise their own fitness, even if that's to the detriment of the fitness of other individuals. So this is the problem of, uh, of cooperation, I guess. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was appreciated fairly early on that hermaphrodism, in terms of being able to produce both female and male gametes, uh, is is really handy, right? Because if you're if you're uh, meeting another individual who uh, is functioning as a male or a female, and you can function as both, then uh, really there's there's uh, you know you've you've got the upper hand. So in that case, uh, hermaphrodism is really the superior strategy when it comes to uh, sexual reproduction. And so early on, there was a lot of discussion about well. The adaptive significance of hermaphrodism must have something to do with the fact that you can breed with anybody in the population, potentially. But those ideas were largely dismissed because they invoked uh, group selection arguments. Uh, it wasn't satisfying to, I guess, individuals from the, uh, you know, the adaptions program because uh, they, they were concerned with uh, evolution or natural selection acting on. Uh, specific genes or you know, specific individuals, and um, you know these these ideas about uh, cooperation and, and hermaphrodism uh, were, were dismissed because they invoked uh, group selection ideas. <clears throat> so then, population genetic formalism came in, and basically it was found that well, yes, sex change from one sex to the other, or you know, a whole range of uh, uh, hermaphroditic strategies can be evolutionary stable uh, simply by, um, you, know, uh, in, you know, we can we can find these evolutionary stable strategies simply by giving individuals uh, a specific age or, 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 or size at, at sex change or sex allocation, uh, uh, such that, you know, well, that's, you know, that's, uh, 
that's basically uh, prescribed by a particular gene. And the optimal time for sex change basically evolves uh, through the generations as selection acts on the optimal time to change sex or to allocate uh, energy into one form of <coughs> sexual functioning or the other. So this is based on basically uh, stable age distributions uh, where you have um, you know, a, a very large population, population size. The demographics are, are basically fixed, uh, and in which case you basically the population converges to a single optimal time for a particular sex allocation uh, pattern. The idea mainly is that uh, with size and age comes a differential fecundity potential for females and males in, in, in what we're talking about protogyny. So, for example, we have uh, polygynous uh, breeding systems where males can competitively exclude smaller males. Uh, it makes sense if individuals start life first as female and then change sex to male when a competitive size, size is reached. Uh, and in the case of perichandry, for example, if you've got breeding pairs or random breeding, uh, because the number of gametes that can be held by the bodily body is more constrained for females, it makes sense to start life as male and then change sex to female once you know, you're, you're a bit bigger and sort of thing. <coughs> so collectively this was uh, referred to as the size advantage model and it was proposed by uh, Gislin, uh, Shanov and Bull and advocated by Warner for a long time. Um, but in essence, uh, this is really just uh, a special case of the shaw model theorem. So, uh, empirical observation of sex change in the wild sort of um, acted to update the size advantage model through time because it became apparent that individuals were using their environment to make decisions about when to change sex. So the size advantage model sort of turned from a purely genetical strategy to a conditional strategy where <coughs> individuals uh, allocate their sex based on the presence or absence of a unilateral cue. That meaning that the individual, the only information that's being used is, is that from the environment going to the individual and then the individual's making a decision based on that information. <coughs> so in going from... Uh, a genetical strategy that's an basically endogenously driven to one that's driven by environmental information. Um, we've basically changed the whole the whole setup uh, because now we can invoke cognition in the whole picture. Uh, individuals aren't just um, you know changing sex based on some developmental switch that happens through the, you know as a function of their biological clock age. Um, but in, it, it, individuals are using information to, to base their decisions on. So, so far, there's no information about what uh, this cue is. Okay? Individuals aren't actually questioning whether the cue is relevant or not. Uh, so when you go from a stable age distribution to a patchy environment, or even if you have variation in growth among individuals, like some individuals find a big patch of food and they grow really fast, all these different things, all these variations um, from the stable, stable size distribution changes uh, what the optimal cue for sex change is. So while the conditional strategy sort of helped to correlate theory and, and, and observation, uh, it actually left us with the same problem as the original size advantage model, meaning that the consensus problem isn't being addressed. The other interesting thing is that when you invoke a cue, when you open yourself up to the information that's out there in the world, well, you know, we're, we're surrounded in a sea of information, right? So it's not so much about whether you can get some information from the environment. <coughs> It's more about how you filter that information and how you get the appropriate information to make the, <coughs> the appropriate decision. So when you uh, invoke a unilateral cue, you're also invoking the possibility that other individuals can interfere with the information that you're receiving. 
<coughs> so that leads to a potential for basically deceptive behaviours uh, and you know starts an arms race in terms of how individuals are getting information from the environment and how they're validating the the, the information or what they think is, is real. So there's a bit of an argument really about whether we should be looking at sex allocation in terms of the size advantage model or in terms of you know cooperative games, collective action problems and these sorts of things. From what I can tell, the size, size, the size advantage model is in fact a cooperative game to begin with. It always has been. Uh, the only you know, uh, issue really is that when we had when we invoke decision rules in terms of genetic determinism. Uh, we're talking about pure or per, sorry, perfect information uh, and individuals uh, questioning whether that information is accurate or not. <coughs> so the problem really is to get to uh, you know, this situation where uh, you want to coordinate your reproductive strategy such that it's matching other individuals' reproductive strategy, but you, you want to do it in such a way that you're not getting duped by other individuals. You want to make sure that you're maximising <coughs> your own fecundity. So you want to go like, from, from situations like this to situations like this, this to this, and so on. So there's incentive for behaviour that's other regarding, meaning that there's incentive for individuals to uh, incorporate um, the, the um, I guess, the... the uh, the word, the, um, the, the welfare of other individuals, right? and, and simply because other individuals, they they're, they're, they're start off, they could be potential competitors, but in the second, at the second, in the same time, they can also be potential reproductive partners. So, uh, if information, if we have this this past model of unilateral cues, if, if information on reproductive value and, and, and dominance and these sorts of things can be gained, uh, it can also be provided. Uh, <coughs> and it can be provided in an antagonistic sense, meaning that individuals can try to manipulate the behaviour of others to their own benefit. Or it can be provided in terms of trying to coordinate, coordinate the system to reach a sort of a egalitarian outcome where everyone uh, gets an equal share. Or it can be somewhere in between, where a corporate outcome is 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 is, is reached, or try is tried to try to be established, um, but that the relative dominance of your individuals are taken into account in the final solution. <coughs> so this is as far as I got with my conceptual understanding of the whole situation. <coughs> uh, it's just a picture. Um, but then I found out about uh, about Nash and Nash's bargaining problem, and uh, I, I found out about this mainly well, through a game theory course, but also through Rufkin, who, who came up with the idea that really, when it comes to reproductive breeding systems, we should be looking at um, <clears throat> how individuals can tend with this um, tension between individual and group interests. And I found that this fit in really nicely with an idea I had a long time ago and I forgot about it. Uh, and that being, if sex allocation is flexible and if individuals are receiving information from the environment to, to, uh, you know, to, to update the information state and make a more informed decision, then natural selection shouldn't be acting on a particular set of genes for prescribing a particular type of sex change or whatnot, but rather should be Acting, natural selection should be acting on the rationality of sex allocation decisions. Um, so, so this this came as a bit of a, a shock to me because I'm thinking, well, you're not really supposed to talk about rationality in terms of non-human animals. Um, but I think that's I think that's a bad, bad decision. I think that concept or the notion of rationality is something that we can look at at all levels of biological organisation. Perhaps even non non-volume, well, in a way. 
Anyway, sorry. So the whole idea with uh, Nash's arbitration scheme is that, well, Nash took a, 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 an axonomic approach to the problem of, of bargaining, and he basically derived uh, uh, a unique solution to uh, this exact problem, but in a very, very, very abstract sense. <clears throat> and basically it's saying, I'm not going to go through all the axioms today, but it's basically saying that there is a unique solution to uh, uh, any bargaining problem between two players, and it's relative to uh, individuals' threat points, uh, individuals' ability to hurt other individuals. Right? And I don't mean necessarily by beating each other up. It could be, you know, those threats could be established in a multitude of ways. For example, just by leaving the group. You know, it doesn't have to be all about aggression. But the point is, is that there's a unique solution, and that solution is basically that which maximizes the product um, of each individual's payoffs relative to their threat points. So this is a good start, I think. It's a good place to start. The, 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 the problem is, of course, that in, in Nash's arbitration scheme, he envisaged someone who, a uh, third party, who's making, you know, he's, he's collecting the information, working out individuals' dominance, threat points, threat points, and these sorts of things, and then making an informed decision about how the goods should be allocated among group members. Um, so you've got this, this arbitrator uh, who's, who's making the final decision. So the problem is how could individuals come to this somewhere near this decision on their own without a third party arbitrator? And basically the issue is that um, you can have um, you know, bargaining that's uh, bargaining you can have bargaining that's not in good faith. Individuals can bargain and, and, and pretend that they're going to come to a, a, a decision together, but then right at the last minute, they're going to take all the goods, they're going to use the information they've obtained, and they're going to wreak havoc and <coughs> be really selfish and bugger up the whole thing. So how do individuals, and, and particularly individuals that have very limited cognitive ability, come to some kind of uh, cooperative solution? that's consistent with the rationality that Nash uh, sort of uh, encapsulates in his um, uh, axioms for arbitration or bargaining. <coughs> so, still to answer this question, I think we need to get to uh, move into extensive form games and look at how individuals update their own information state uh, to, to, to see basically whether individuals can reach a similar belief about their position in the situation, their position in the world, their position as they as it relates to other individuals in the group. So the sequential dominance assessment game by Krebs and Wilson and later Inquist and Lima in the biological setting um, seems to make sense in this context. So what it says is that individuals have different resource holding power, power, they have different strength, different dominance, I guess, uh, but individuals have incomplete information on those relative dominance relationships. Uh, but that individuals can obtain additional, additional information on the cost of continued conflict with each consecutive interaction. So the behavioral strategy specifies, specifies a belief and uh, a set of behavioural response probability distributions for each node in the information set. Basically, that means in every any position of uh, information state, there's a whole set of behaviours that uh, the individual could potentially choose to, to further the interaction. Of course, they could also choose just to bail. Okay, so for me then, there's there's two two uh, parts to this. The first is well, there's three really. The first is uh, you know, how do, how do we formalise cooperative game as it relates to uh, sex allocation? And we could use we can use both an axionomic approach or an extensive form approach. 
The second is, well, if we are to assume that individuals don't have, that uh, in, uh, in animals like reef fish don't have an arbitrator, uh, we need to work out how exactly individuals are reaching uh, a similar belief, how they're, how they're coming to a potential negotiated solution. So we have to basically test uh, whether sequential dominance assessment can actually happen in nature. Uh, and we have the assumption for that, variation in RHP and the predictions. So these are specific predictions of the game. There's, whole lot, there's a whole bunch of variations of this, this game, um, but I'm not going to get into that today. Uh, but, the, but the predictions are increased contest duration, the reduction in RHP asymmetry. Uh, which is bas basically because um, as individuals become closer in, in size or closer in dominance, uh, you need more information, you need to gather more information on the actual difference between individuals. And there should also be an increased escalation with a reduction in RHP asymmetry. And this is about basically sampling design when you're getting information. If you're getting information first up, you want to do is use uh, uh, sampling techniques that are cheap, but have can potentially bring in a lot of information. Uh, the but there's you know you can have a bunch of other techniques that are uh, more costly that give you more precise information, but you want to leave those those sampling techniques to last if you need them. Okay, so sorry. So the first aim of this study is to, sorry, try, uh, attempt to formulate the corporate game within the context of sex allocation, uh, to test the assumptions and predictions of a sequential dominance assessment game, and then secondly, to examine whether the low escalation rank signals, what we might refer to as conventional signals, provide referential information on the likely cost context, contest outcomes. So the initial sampling strategies that are used or techniques that are used by individuals in getting information in the beginning, ones that don't involve costly fighting, uh, you know, what's the actual content of the signals that are being provided to other individuals and, and received in turn? So specifically, as in terms of functionality, what we're interested in is the parameters that govern the outcome of, of fights and govern the outcome of fecundity. So we're interested in initial sex in the beginning, of course, because they're going to have some kind of sex. It could be male, female, it could be, they could be non-reproductive. Uh, body size, dominance, and aggression, and plasticity and aggression. This is really important because you don't want to be aggressive all the time. You only want to be aggressive when uh, basically you have no other choice. <clears throat> and finally, do individual signals, sorry, do individual signal commitment to a given gender role following the negotiation phase? So is there, if there's sequential dominance assessment happening, yes, fine, individuals can reach this new information state, but then do they act on it in terms of facilitating the collective action, this is, well, collective, the collective decision? Right, so you could come to the decision, well, yes, we're both dominant. What are we going to do about it? You can flip a coin or, you know, someone could take the lead, for example, and say, well, I'll function as the least of a gun sex or whatever. So we want to know whether individuals commit to the negotiated solution. Uh, and, you know, it's, of course, biologically, it's of relevance to ask whether those commitment sig signals are referentially meaningful. Do they actually have any functional uh, meaning? Okay, so uh, this 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 matrix basically shows uh, the situation when you have a, a, a pair of individuals, right? Uh, and we can see that over here, when you have a player A is male, player B is female, they both benefit, they both reproduce. Perfect. Over here is the same, and then here and here they've got nothing because they're both the same sex. So this is a purely coordination, pure coordination problem. Uh, of course, in nature, it's not that simple. Uh, often we have 
Oh, sorry, I'll just I'll just stay with this one first. Uh, we can add to that coordination problem by throwing in body size. Uh, as I was mentioned before in the size advantage model, uh, if you have a monogamous pair, it benefits if the largest individual is female because uh, egg production is constrained by body size more than sperm production. So in this situation here, when we account for the female body size distribution, uh, the maximum fecundity of the male, if males play player A, is purely dependent on the body size of the other, <coughs> of the other player. Right? So for example, if player B is the largest individual, it pays for individuals to get to this spot here, as opposed to this spot here. Right? Even though both of these uh, Nash equilibria, this is the preferred, preferred spot if we have an asymmetry in body size between players. Once we get more individuals in the group, things become more complicated. Uh, the male fitness is, or fecundity is still dependent on female body size. Um, but it's also dependent on how many other females are in the group, for example. So I'm going to use G from now on, uh, and G is going to relate to the number of individuals in the group, and I'm just going to make it the case that uh, a, a group G of one, there's one individual that's female, and there's a female fecundity of one. So in that case, we can just drop the F uh, after this. But in any case, once we get uh, to having multiple members in the group, uh, the male payoffs are dependent on competitive ability. So the, the dominance of player A, uh, the payoff for, for player A is the dominance uh, times um, the number of group members, number of individuals in the group, minus the number of individuals that are contesting for the male role. Uh, which in this case is just two. <clears throat> and, and of course, uh, for this player up here, uh, the payoff is basically group size minus two, minus whatever this other player claims. So the, the important point to make here, and this is a, this is a, uh, a zero sum game, in that whatever this player wins, this player loses, and the important point to make is that the maximum fecundity of any player can only ever be g minus 2. And that doesn't matter how you divide the pi. <coughs> so we can, we can from that, uh, just looking at basic competitive outcomes, uh, these are the decision rules that individuals should be, should be going off to maximise their fitness. If group size is 2, uh, if your individual dominance is equal or greater than point, than point 0.5, sorry, that should be point 0.5, not point 0.05, uh, <coughs> then <coughs> basically that's the point at which individual should decide to go into the female role. If these are smaller than these number to begin with when the individual starts its life, then we can infer that the strategy is going to be male to female if we're talking about sequential sex change. If G is greater than 2, uh, the payoff of all players equals the dominance of that individual player by G minus 2. This is this uh, here. And we can generalise that to the situation where we have more than two males in the group um, by simply substituting this 2 for M, the number of males in the group. So in this situation, uh, when D of an individual player is greater or equal to 1 over G minus 2, then it, it makes sense to change sex to the male role because that's you're going to increase your fecundity by doing so. And we can generalise that to G minus M. Note that this is equal to or greater than. That means that there's a point of indifference. Right? So there's a, there's a point where individuals uh, you know, have a particular dominance of value where they can get, they're going to get the same fecundity whether they function as female, female or male. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. Okay, so the, the, the problem with all of this is that uh, if individuals uh, are making their, their 
choices at the same time without any sort of consultation. Um, and basically uh, they're playing a purely competitive game, then it's always going to be the case that uh, someone's going to get excluded from the group at least some of the time. So we need uh, some, some payoffs and some strategies that specify how an individual might respond to other individuals in the group considering that other individuals in the group are not only potential competitors, but are also potential uh, reproductive partners. So this is, this is the, the payoff matrix for a cooperative game, the cooperative game. Uh, it's not complete in that I've only put in error terms for a couple of the strategies so far. Um, but basically what's happening here, we have female against Female, female against male, against cooperator, the egalitarian cooperator, female against a discrete bargainer, uh, female against a uh, continuous bargainer, and then male here, male down here against those strategies, cooperator against all of those strategies, discrete bargainer against all of these strategies, and continuous bargainer against all of those strategies. The reason why I have discrete and continuous bargainers is that we have two different kinds of hermaphrodites in nature, right? The first kind is one that switches sex completely. So it goes from female to male in one go. It doesn't trade in continuous units of, of sperm and egg, or relatively more continuous. Uh, the other kind is a simultaneous hermaphrodite who can basically produce both egg and sperm at the same time and at different ratios. <coughs> And so these are quite these are quite different strategies because it changes the possible um, uh, uh, the possible payoff space, I guess. Uh, but specifically, when it comes to the strategy, uh, we have basically a, dis a couple of discrete steps uh, when the discrete bargainer is playing against males and playing against other discrete <coughs> discrete uh, bargainers. So over here, if we have a male against a uh, discrete bargainer, the payoff is going to be uh, uh, this. If the dominance of player B, who is the bargainer, is greater than G minus 2, because when the dominance of player 2 is greater than this value, he's going to function as male, and then we're going to get uh, the outcome of a competitive game. When the dominance is less than this value, right, this point of indifference, we've turned to a cooperative outcome in that the discrete bargainer has decided to function as female because if she, fun if, if, if she function, functions as male, she's going to lose out. Okay, so this, these payoffs represent basically rational decisions in as much as that they maximise the fecundity of a given individual. I just want to clarify two things. First one is, what are you assuming about the rest of the individuals in the group? Are you assuming they're all, they're all females? Right. So, and yeah. then secondly, like just if you look at that one, you've got, uh, if G is 3, right, then that fraction is 1. And because you have greater than, equal, less than, equal, then both conditions are met. So That's right. Which, which one is the or, or do they converge to the same payoff? Uh, if group size is three, what yeah, do you think? It's the top the, one or the bottom one? Or are they equivalent? Well, they're equivalent. Okay. Right, so they're the same. When the group size is three, it doesn't matter what you choose, uh, as long as you coordinate with the other players. Um, but having said that, if group size is likely to increase in the future, in terms, sorry, if, if, if the number of females coming in is likely to increase in the future, then uh, they're not. It's not going to be. They're not going to be indifferent anymore. Uh, so, sorry, I should clarify what group size is right now. Group in reality, group size should be a group of uh, individuals who all make decisions, and, and it's really pretty complicated. In this case, right now, I'm simply showing the two-player uh, game. Um, so, and I'm just assuming that basically, when group size as, you know, with an increase in group size, that's basically the number of females or cooperators that the dominant individual has collected in their group. Uh, 
happen. So uh, just just to simplify things for the moment. <clears throat> okay. Oh dear. So these uh, these uh, discrete conditional strategies uh, yield these payoffs. Importantly, though, uh, we need to consider uh, the error associated with uh, making a sex allocation decision, uh, and we also need to consider the cost of, uh, of, of getting the information that's required to make that decision. Uh, and we, as, as I said, we have a couple of those over here as well. Uh, so I'm going to go straight here because this summarises everything a bit, bit, bit. It's a bit easier to. So, so what we have is two situations. We have uh, a situation where we have monogamous pairs, for example. We have an evolutionary stable strategy. Each player basically gets a payoff of 0.5 if they, for example, produce, um, if they just randomise their decision half female, half male. Um, that's, that's the evolutionary stable strategy. Uh, we then have a bargaining solution for uh, a cooperative strategy that doesn't consider body size. And then we have another one that considers body size of each individual. So this one, for example, you know, if we have a monogamous pair, two individuals and one's bigger than the other, and they can work and arrange things such that the bigger individual is a female, then it's moved from this bargaining solution to this bargaining solution. A bargaining solution in this case is a bit um, uh, ambiguous in that there's actually not much conflict, there's not really any hard conflict in this situation. Um, but in any, uh, any case, so this line represents essentially the efficiency frontier. We have another efficiency frontier which is here, when group size is greater than two. This is the competitive game. Uh, player, player B is here, player A is here. This is a payoff for player A when his dominance is one, when he has full dominance of the game. Uh, and you see the value is G minus two. Same for this guy, if his dominance um, is one. So basically this is how much each individual can potentially potentially get from the interaction if we're, we're assuming full competition. Um, <clears throat> if individuals can sort out their differences, then there's an efficiency frontier to, to be had, meaning that uh, in this, so for example, in this situation where both both individuals are contest, contesting the resource of a group of females and uh, player B is the most competitive, player B is going to get a payoff of uh, G minus 2, and player A is going to get a payoff of nothing. If player A takes his dominance into account and decides to function as a female, its payoff is going to go to 1, and the other player's payoff is going to go to G minus 1. Right? So this line here uh, is, is the efficient, efficiency frontier we expect the bargain solution to be, in this case, proportional to, to dominance, well, equivalent to dominance. Uh, and so every point, every blue point here is a Nash bargaining solution relative to each of these Nash competitive equilibria right here. And so all those equations I was just uh, that, so there's um, expressions I put up earlier. All of that can actually be simplified greatly. Um, it's basically this value here. It's, it's simply the value that maximizes the product of each player's payoffs relative to their, their threat point, their, their, their dominance. And I'll just note this situation here. Often the corporate outcome is so costly, uh, it's, 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 a, it's hard to reach a corporate outcome, right? And once this happens, of course, individuals should be selected to return to the competitive game. So in talking about discrete and continuous strategies, uh, simultaneous hermaphrodites can access this entire efficiency frontier. 
and also this entire competitive frontier. But discrete bargainers can only access these endpoints. And that's because they can't reach this cooperative solution because they can't trade in small enough units. They can only be one sex or the other. And this is just the model playing out for a few different group sizes. So back to what Sean was saying, well, here we have the efficiency frontier for a monogamous pair. This is the situation of group size of three. The blue is the discrete strategy. The green is the continuous strategy. The red is the competitive game. And basically at this point, it's absolutely right that individuals, Sean's absolutely right in that individuals are indifferent between functioning as female or male. The issue is to get everyone coordinated on the same page. Once you get past a group size, well, I think once you reach a group size, actually, sorry, that's the point of indifference. That's a group size of four. That's a group size of five. And then that's a group size of 10. So once you reach that point of indifference, there's always some indifference as a function of dominance. And there's this area here. This player here could actually claim if she wanted to as a male and reduce this player's fitness, but she wouldn't actually be gaining anything from it. Okay, so I guess the main point here is that if individuals can somehow put dominance into their reasoning regarding sex allocation decisions, then they can potentially reach a much more profitable situation as opposed to playing a purely competitive game. Okay, so let's now get to the actual behavior of this animal. Do they know what time it is? Okay. What we find in this animal is that when you pull males out of the population, females that are left in the group start increasing their activity rates. They change, they reduce their feeding, they increase aggression, number of interactions, and all this sort of business. So this is a map of a population. All of these individuals are tagged and sexed in the population. This is in the lagoon of Lizard Island. And what we find is that when you remove the males, there are, in fact, pairwise contests. The pairwise contests can end by a retreat or a behavior that's called nest bend, which is basically showing the abdominal region. And the retreat or nest bend basically follows to territory expansion, pseudo-spawning sometimes, and essentially the expression of male behavior follows shortly by a change in gonad morphology. From that information, I could basically provide a qualitative analysis of the signal rankings during the pairwise contests. And these are here ranked in terms of likely energetic cost of the behavior. So we go from head bob to these different displays of the actual body itself, and then into the physical displays, sorry, the physical interactions. So we go from conventional fighting to non-conventional fighting. But then we have these S bends and pseudo-spawns that I believe function as commitment signals. In terms of the sequential dominance assessment game, relative size is, in terms of the assumption, relative size is a strong predictor of who wins an outcome, but it's not. Body size doesn't provide perfect information. And in terms of escalation rank and the number of events and size difference, the data does conform to the predictions of the size advantage, sorry, 
the sequential DOMICS assessment again. The bigger the size difference, the, the less the number of events before a retreat, and the, the, less, the, the smaller the size difference, the greater the escalation rank. The, the red dots are female contests, the blue dots are male contests, female contests, male contests event, and you can see that really it's very quite structured um, in terms of when these behaviours are, uh, uh, are used, but also there's a, uh, quite a lot of similarity between females and males in contest behaviour. Okay, so body size provides some information on, on dominance, but not perfect information. And SBEN displays uh, predict who remains female. Um, and pseudospawns predict who become male. So these commitment displays, well, we can see that they're credible because they're, they're costly. And they're also, they're fairly, fairly straightforward to understand. The female display, basically, she's moving her abdominal region in view of the, of the male. And this is a fecund female. And so this is the information that she's giving to uh, the prospective sex changer. Uh, basically, she's showing how fat her belly is. And this, 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 this signal is, is, is provided even when she's, uh, she's not fecund. So it can act as a referential symbol to fish reproduction as well. So what I'm going to focus on... Oh, shit, no. What I'm going to focus on uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, signals is 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 the head ball and this region here. So the the other displays, the tail flicking, the lateral displays, these are sensible in in that. Well, you know, they're, they're giving information about the actual size of, of, of their body. The head bob is a little bit more cryptic. What the hell does it mean? And why the hell should they be bobbing their head? So I wanted to find out why. Uh, this is a female. This is the female. This is the same individual after sex change. Uh, so note the, the change from here to here. This is basically a male, male coloration, but also there's darkening all along here and all along here. This part here is fairly constant. It doesn't vary very much. Whereas uh, this part here is highly variable, so it has a potential to uh, operate as, as, a, as, a, as a badge of, of, of status. And this is basically when you look in front of the fish, and so this is what another individual is seeing when they see their mate. This is what they're seeing here in a female, and this is the male. So to, to get to the bottom of this, I cut out all the branchial steagle rays of, all, of a bunch of fish. Here's a female, here's a male showing uh, this variation. Uh, and these are actually modified badges that I've... Uh, I've, I've, I've basically created different badges by using Indian ink, give them a tattoo. Okay, we cut those out, uh, standardise the image, and we can define the shape of the, uh, the badge itself. We can get out a whole bunch of morphometrics, look at asymmetry, uh, look at the, the size of the particles and the patches, um, and basically, we, I use this threshold value here. And what it shows is that, uh, so this is just badge size. This is badge size for females. This is badge size for males. Uh, so this is, a, this is a meta badge because it's giving information not only on body size. There's a relationship here between body size and badge size. Uh, badge size in terms of the total amount of area in of the brachiosteal rays and lower jaw that's, that's covered in black pigment. Um, but it also gives distinct information about the sex of the individual. So these, are the, these are the males, these are the females, and body size increases. As body size increases, the size of the badge also increases. So this badge uh, provides, indeed, functional referential meaning in terms of individual's dominance. It doesn't give any information on the contest outcome. When we have staged pairwise contests, individuals with bigger badges don't necessarily win the fight, 
when the, when the individuals are size matched. So oh, I'm not sure whether I'm disappointed about that or not. But essentially, the badge is giving information on body size and sex, but when you have two exactly size matched individuals, the badge no longer provides useful information. So I guess, uh, functionally, that makes some sense in that, well, if, if it did provide perfect information, there'd be no reason for anyone to escalate. Um, but in fact, it doesn't provide perfect information, so there may be a reason to escalate the fight when you're really closely matched in body size. So the referential reading of these conventional signals, uh, so far we have body size, uh, which is directly related to dominance, as we've already seen. And I'm currently looking at whether there's additional information in this badge in relation to aggression and in relation to plasticity in aggression. So to conclude, sequential dominance assessment results in sex allocation in the face of competition. Selfish behavior is other regarding. In turn, sex allocation consensus maximizes group stability and specifically retention of individuals within social groups. So there's a synergism between individual fitness and group productivity by information gathering. And this can lead to a whole bunch of population, interesting population dynamics, such as uh, positive density dependence. The evolution of functional referential meaning. Sequential dominance assessment and the tension between individual and group interests selects for cheap, effective, and honest sampling heuristics. So functionally referential meaning is not a problem that's faced by all of life, it's, it's a problem that's faced by all of life forms, it's not a special feature of human intelligence. And so for this reason, we have, well basically we have this system in, 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 in the marine environment where a lot of uh, life history decisions are being made um, based on visual, uh, the visual senses and the, the, uh, the features of communicative interaction. And so, so in relation to that, uh, you know, vision and communication are likely to be really important to the functioning of hermaphroditic animals and societies on coral reefs in general. Coral reefs are particularly interesting because so many of the, of the animals that live there are, hermaphrodite, are hermaphroditic. So I'm really interested in this, this concept of, uh, of rationality. And, and, and perhaps how we can use this concept of rationality to better define the units of natural selection. So I'm going to be a bit of a dick and come up with a new hypothesis. And I'm going to say that the appropriate unit of natural selection is not an object at all. It's not a gene, it's not a genome, it's not an individual group or population. Natural selection acts on the rationality of particles in their aggregate forms. Natural selection acts on the ability of individuals to maximize their fitness given their information state. That's rationality. And when we view natural selection in this way, a whole bunch of really interesting things happen. There's a whole bunch of arguments out there about, well, all sorts of things. But basically, I think that if we can use rationality as, the, as a unit of selection, we can start to get at some of the discrepancies between Gould's contingency and uh, Darwin's and Dawkins' selfish gene and multi-level selection and Gaia theory. For example, right, it's not so much, the, it's not the argument that Earth system science is, you know, teleological or not. It's about whether the system is rational or not. If it's not rational, it's not going to persist. And the same argument can hold for an individual. It's, what, importantly though, rationality isn't about intelligence per se. It's not a human thing. <coughs> rationality is about maximizing fitness given the information state of the individual or aggregate form. Individual state could be simple, just like a, a, a string of DNA, right? A string of DNA has an information state even though it doesn't have a brain. Anyway. Uh, so that's what I'd like to look into into the future. And that's it. So um, this is a this has been a, my body of work for the last few years. Uh, these the, the models for corporate, corporate sex allocation and negotiating sex roles uh, is my own work. Uh, the signal and communication aggression is a collaboration with a bunch of crew, and I'd like to thank 
these people for a whole bunch of things. You can read about it if you want. <laughs>